um, Melanie Jackson, who is an artist. Uh, Melanie is um, is an artist, and she's also the, the head of sculpture at Slade School of Art. And uh, she is collaborating with Esther Leslie, who's professor of political aesthetics at at Birkbeck University. Uh, and they're going to talk about uh, the collaboration that they've been doing for a while. Uh, the first part was Earth Flans Part One. And they're now working on the second part of that investigation, which engages with synthetic biology, nanotechnology, and some of the ideas that, that Philip was opening up in the first half of this. Uh, just to say before we move on, anyone who uh, is new to the Arts Catalyst, I think Joe, who is yeah. our marketing lady at the back, would very much uh, like you to sign up for our mailing list if you'd be interested in coming to similar events in the future or other events. So I'm going to hand over to Melanie and Esther now. Thank you. Can I do that? Now? Okay. <laughs> if, if I'm not loud enough, please say. Um, I thought I'd begin just by introducing um, where this inquiry has come from, and then after my both kind of form two small sections of text that we've kind of generated for a lot of conversation in front of some visions. So um, I began to get interested in um, this new era that um, Philip has outlined very well, at least in an era that's defined itself in science, which um, is kind of just, just talks about itself on a new threshold, a new uh, revolution. And I'm always interested in revolutionary moments, what it may be. And I think um, one, one thing that I've explored in other work as well is is this kind of the complexity and detail of knowledge. And this, this is a shift that intrigued me in old work, in old pieces of work, when uh, a material and an object has technologies uh, embedded in it that are so complex they require collectives or networks or collaborations mm -hmm. Sorry, to understand. Sorry, Mike. Can I... Is it on? Yeah. Right, okay. Um, so, I'm, I was interested in unpicking that kind of relationship with knowledge that required collaboration, yet often to actually um, to back up individualism. Um, and I was also interested in other historical moments where we've been very excited by the urge for transformation and the urge for kind of, uh, um, a, a complete kind of fantastical rewriting of what might be possible. And one of the things that interested me about synthetic biology, especially after doing workshops and things, is this sense that we could make anything. If only the knowledge, um, it's only a case of understanding knowledge, yet people still rather, um, sometimes certain discoveries are driven by, by need, such as medicine, but others by this kind of desire that anything might be possible. And that chimes me with other historical moments which show us for good and bad. I don't know if you want to say something about your kind of background interest. Yeah, I, I suppose in some ways I, I perform the partly the, the historical roles. While, while I see Philip has taken us on a fantastic journey into the present and the future, what I'm always looking at is, is these moments of, of repetition and, and a kind of impulse um, manifest through scientific investigation and an impulse towards dreaming, dreaming new forms and, and the shapes of those fantasies which are often recurrent, you know, obviously immortal life and, and these uh, sorts of questions. And it was, I mean, that only came to me because of some things I'd written about Goethe through Walter Benjamin's idea of the Ur form, the primal form, which he took from Goethe's notion of the Ur Pflanze, the primal plant. And what Goethe thought he had found in the 1780s or when, whenever, was this, this plant found or imagined it, and that's the thing, this plant out of which the whole of nature has formed, and um, out of this he starts to write uh, uh, about ideas of metamorphosis and also notions that he has dreamt or discovered something that nature herself would be envious of. And this, this assumption in a sense of, of the artist, botanist, scientist, which Goethe was, 
that he could imagine an infinity of forms. And he used the word protean, which Philip also used in, in his talk, which locks us into a sort of mythological world of Proteus, um, the dreamer who can adopt any form. And it, it's sort of thinking through the, the nexus points of, of dreaming and the mythological and scientific investigations across larger periods of time that I suppose has, has motivated me and that has formed part of the dialogue with Melanie and produced the excitement around thinking that through in, in a current context of nanotechnologies and um, synthetic biology. So our, I mean, our starting point is a long conversation that's culminated in a free supplement, gardening supplement, that you're really welcome to take away with you. And um, we decided that we wanted to pursue this and to try and make a kind of, uh, of a film work. I had to show the drawing room a couple of years ago, which just began to actually literally sketch out my interests. So I was kind of drawing, rather than drawing on paper, I used paper to draw with these um, three-dimensional forms that try to kind of apprehend this urge for this urge for the control of form and the, and the manipulation of matter. And I was really intrigued by what new technology had to tell old technology by by these um, kind of crudely hewn forms being being selected to by their kind of digital counterparts. So there's lots of themes that were set up through our conversation, um, again about this kind of dream space, this fantasizing that chimes a lot with fairy tale and with all kinds of transformative moments that we've kind of written into um, a script that we're developing film work for. Um, I'm just going to show you, uh, just very quickly flick through some of these kind of gargantuan forms and this relationship I suppose between nanotechnology being um, uh, uh, today's scientific answer to all our problems of pollution, of, of uh, kind of real cultural problems with um, overconsumption that, that somehow through these kind of magical um, you know, uh, adaptations of form that will suddenly be have copious supplies of what we need. Um, and I was really interested also in the, kind of the amateur, the amateur kind of scientist and um, how those kind of disruptions in the scale from the minuscule to the gargantuan kind of um, work, out, um, work, work out in the everyday. But also interested, um, we're both very interested in kind of crystals and crystalline <coughs> structures and the origins of form and got very interested in um, 19th century technologies of manipulating clay and that kind of mastery and formlessness for such a driver. So I'm just going to cut into a... film. Um, so we're developing a film at the moment and today we're actually just showing you work in progress. And we've been experimenting as well, having quite a lot of conversations about how to explore that narrative, how to structure it, how to, how to kind of enter into this kind of dream space um, whilst, whilst retaining a kind of documentary um, and informative kind of edge. So we've been experimenting with many things. And today we're just going to show you some of the imagery that we've kind of drawn upon, some of which is research material, some of which, which may find its way into the film, but, but also um, trying different voices and performance styles which we hope to finish over the summer. So I'm just going to read, which is for about 10 minutes, um, and this will cover some of the things, actually, that um, Philip opened up, particularly about the aesthetics of this new science, and then Esther's going to uh, expand on the kind of um, relationship between industry and, um, and this kind of desire for form and consumption. The section is called Dreams of Plenty. The plants are fairy tales are gigantic, gigantic, abundant, and alluring. Of course they are. Fairy tales are the dreams of peasants, those grafters, gleaners, diggers, and toilers. Food obsesses them and compels them to do the silliest things. The baby Rapunzel is forsaken for a handful of leaves from the ramping patch. The three wishes are squandered on sausages. The back bent peasant longs for profusion and for the never-ending. They imagine the tastiest morsels appearing out of thin air or swelling to ripeness at speed. Think of those magical lands of abundance. The land of milk and honey, of cocaine, of sloraphan land and lover land or Jack's beanstalk. 
When Jack traded his mother's cow for a handful of beans, what sort of deal had he done? A cow for mere beans, his mother was not pleased. But these were no ordinary beans. Chucked through a window in disgust, they took root and grew and grew to the power of magic into a gigantic stalk. This monster plant poked into the clouds and Jack scampered up the giant plant, only to run into a giant man for whom Jack himself is food. Fee, fi, fo, fum, I smell the blood of an Englishman. Be he alive or be he dead, I'll grind, grind his bones to make my bread. Jack is smart and manages to rob golden coins from the giant and bring them back to earth. On the second foray, he grabs the hen that lays the golden eggs. What a machinery of nature that is. A hen that produces gold, endless, smooth, oval bullets of desire each and every day without effort. It is as wondrous as the caves that open up on command and give access to a zillion twinkling gems, which even in such copious supply lose not a jot of their monetary value. Finally, and almost bringing about his downfall, Jack absconds with a magic harp. The giant beanstalk has served its purpose and Jack chops it down just as the giant descends on it. He crashes to the ground uprooting the mon monster plant as he drops. Though Jack's giant was vanquished, modern commercial culture has brought us new ones. Underneath the accelerating rationalisation of the system, a world of myths burgeoned. These myths took shape in entertainment, in, a, in publicity, in commodity promises, and in the dreams of science. One such disguise came in the shape of the jolly green giant. Here was a descendant of Green George, of Little Leaf Man, of Whitsuntide Labs. He is a jack in the green from the days of asphalt and electricity. He is a creation of folklore, the entwinement of a folkish figure with commerce. The jolly green giant took his name from the large peas variety green giant. There he is, sorry. Um, he is Jack in the Green for the days of Ashcox and Electricity. He is a creation of folklore. The jolly green giant took his name from the large peas variety green giant, harvested and canned by the company he represented, the Minnesota Valley Cannon Company. The jolly green giant tirelessly, magically brought to consumers giant peas fresh in a can and the sweetest niblets of corn farmed where Indians used to roam. This was the era when the jolly green giant strode through the valley in stop motion animation muttering fo, fum, fi, fi, but the wobbling beer moth was too frightening and was later substituted with a motionless figure straddling the landscape far in the distance. He shadowed the valley and its elves at work busily in the factory, booming his catchphrase, ho, ho, ho. This folkish, fairyish figure was such a star that the company named itself after him. The jolly green giant appeared as the giant at the top of a corn stalk, he peers down from the clouds where he harvests the corn that lives up to storybook magic. His parent company was long ago subsumed into General Mills, which is at the upper end of the Fortune 500 list of companies, ranked by gross, sorry, uh, ranked by gross revenue. General Mills owns him along with the Pillsbury Doughboy, Betty Crocker, Old El Paso, Good Earth, Nature Valley, and Lucky Charms. The green giant is fused into an industrial giant of food production. We are still peasants, still dreaming of magic foods. Excuse me, slight. Lost half the film. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We are still peasants, still dreaming of magic foods, of effortless nutrition and speeded up rewards. We are still peasants, where the amateurs who graft and craft and nurture the heaviest pumpkins and the vegetable giants of the annuals on the show, or laboratory agri-workers exploring technically orientated urges for supersized crops through the addition of carbon nanotubes to fertiliser. 
From China, seeds of rice, radishes, tomatoes, bell peppers, watermelon, wheat and herbal medicines have all been blasted 250 miles into space in high altitude balloons or spacecraft. The high vacuum, microgravity and cosmic radiation they claim can bring back mutations in the seed's DNA. In space crop parts, vegetables and fruit are said to grow to 10 times their average size. Farms stretch into the distance of greenhouses stuffed with monster melons, tied to their supports to prevent them crushing the gardens below, elephant aubergines and walking pumpkins, ten times their normal size, and almost fit for Cinderella. Golden rice, super corn, and cosmic wheat are our new magic beans. The giant turnip of Slavic folk folklore is outbid by supersized lobsters and chickens. Aqua bounty is developing fast. Um, advanced hybrid salmon, trout and tilapia that are designed to grow faster than their conventional siblings. Metamorphic's true range selection enables agricultural entrepreneurs to program animal coat, colour and sheen, muscle texture, tenderness and size. Nature is imitated and extended in the natural machine through biomimesis. Nanotubes mimic the action of hairs on the epidermal surface of the Venus flytrap. Biomimetic robots perform the locomotion of snakes. Where once technologies were deployed as mediators, now they are held as remediators. Our dreams are populated by vaccine-producing bananas or antibody proteins and tobacco that can counter HIV or rabies. We dream up tropical plants that can survive harsh winters, clean up pollutants with former industries. We fantasize about plants that form into tables right in the field or gourds that swell into comfortable four-bedroom homes. We dream of growing complex systems that photosynthesize their own energy supplies, clean the air around them, ameliorate the excesses of former times. We dream of printer hardware in our homes that can coax any form into being and machines that can enter the space of the cell. Biological and chemical function is reimagined as a substrate, as a block, as circuitry for the development of anything that can be imagined. The peasants who worked on the field and in the factories needed to sleep. Their dreams made rebels of them from time to time, but technologies are quiescent and dreamless. Technologies are deployed to transmute collective longings into fact. And when it comes to gargantuan manipulations of scale and purpose, technologies of the ministry are required. Yoked through modern nanotechnologies is a new peasantry, a resilient proletariat. In the nano world, nature is harnessed in, as a new force for production. At a billionth of a metre, the properties of materials behave in curious ways. The periodic table projects outwards into multiple new dimensions, at every scale displaying new behaviours. The self-organising abilities of DNA are mobilised in nanomachines. They're captured for use as a frenetic activity of bacterial self-replication, molecular self-assembly and self-organisation, biological stimulus and response systems, and viral architecture. At the nanoscale, mesosopic elements such as enzymes, nucleic acids, ribosomes, chloroplasts, mitochondrions, fragella and the like are rebadged as a new working class, grafting away inside living cells, constructing, reconstructing, destroying, clearing, cleaning, sweeping, accelerating, bending, twisting, rotating, operating, shooting, combining. Blossfeld revealed the revised nature made by recording machines. Photographic devices such as time lapse and enlargements unlock structural compositions and self formations. Nature is again revised in today's processes. What had once been speculated upon, known only diagrammatically, becomes confirmed. Scanning, tunneling microscopes and atomic force microscopes grasp down to the nanoscale. Such microscopes target beams one million times thinner than a strand of hair and make a legible texture of the minuscule changes in energy levels between chemical bonds that are holding atoms together. Single atoms have been perceived and captured before, but now we can see the bonds that link them, the bonds that show the chemical composition of the solidarity that inheres in nature. The schema becomes an index. The lens, or its equivalent in the quantum microscope, is a conduit into a world previously unknown. 
The images these machines make with their unseeing eyes are greyer still than Blosfeld's black and white prints. To compensate for this disappointment in vision, this all too grey nature, we make the results scintillating for a public. The magic of science commutes into the magic of vision. These new indexical forms are reanimated, redrawn and drawn upon. Forms are picked out in peacock hues, in fluorescent rainbows, in iridescent striations. It is a mythical world, an exaggerate, sorry. Forms are picked out in peacock hues, fluorescent rainbows, iridescent striations, powdery surfaces and doughy strings. It is a mythical, exaggerated, magnified universe of plasticine and silk, polystyrene tiddlywinks and silver cake decorations, ice cream sundaes, Christmas tree baubles, Lego and disco glitter balls. So I'm, I'm going to um, read a section which is more about um, ideas around the crystal or looking at the, the relationship between clay, which is one of the things that interests us and which comes up throughout the film as, as a kind of originary or ur material, in a sense, a primal material that lends itself to constant forming and has done, you know, through much of human history, it's mud, you know, from mud to crystals, which in our imagination might often be thought of as opposite principles, in a sense, as dark, slimy, formless mud versus the, the crystalline, um, uh, perfection of something like a diamond, but of course, in in actuality, in material form, these these things are um, symbiotic or also identical in in various uh, ways. So this this section is moving between um, ideas of clay and clay formation and crystals and crystalline formation, but it's also a weird concatenation of of uh, themes around consumerism and growth and provide something of a kind of historical backstory perhaps to some of the things in the, se the section just presented and moves very quickly over 10 minutes really from questions of life's origins to, to questions of gem TV and so on. And one of my particular interests is liquid crystal um, as, as a form and something we're hoping to develop within the film, which is a, a sort of self-consciousness of, of the crystalline medium uh, through which we experience and are attempting to understand these new technologies. So I have a kind of more conventional slide presentation to show you as I read from this section. So the Crystal Palace, a building of transparent glass and skeletal iron, was built in London to house the Great Exhibition of 1851. It was a showcase for the products of labour of Britons and the world. Its glassiness was an incipient sign of the shop windows that would front the department stores into which it would evolve. While the form would model the department stores and mouths to come, it also connected the building to a train of utopian thinking. 
For example, utopian socialist Charles Fourier, who devised a great translucent palace called a phalanstery as part of his utopian vision called harmony. It foresaw crystal palaces of iron and glass wherein the mutual gratification of individual desires and passions would serve the general good, based on an elaborate theory of human motivation described by Fourier as the geometrical calculus of passionate attraction. The real Crystal Palace sat atop a disharmonious and unequal society. It was a place in which the industrial goods of the world, proto-commodities that were little crystals of attraction, would gather, rally, and absorb the energies of consumer attention. They would later be replicated, reproduced, and mass-reproduced beyond measure. The exhibition hall, a glass and iron structure, had affinities with the arcades, of which Walter Benjamin wrote, today arcades dot the metropolitan landscape like caves containing the fossil remains of a vanished monster, the consumer of the pre-imperial era of capitalism, the last dinosaur of Europe. He meant that the old style consumer, the habitué of the delightful arcades, was a dinosaur about to become extinct in a new regime of mass consumption. <laughs> Ooh, technology. Inelegant environments of strip lighting and cheap as chips, off the peg, ready-made, soon to break commodities, laid out rationally in a science of shopping. Arcades were made extinct, demolished in Baron Haussmann's reshaping of the city of Paris in the 1850s, part of a modernization project inaugurated by Emperor Napoleon III. Haussmannization was the name for the construction of vast, shop-lined boulevards designed to confound barricade building. When the Crystal Palace Company moved the building from Hyde Park to Sydenham Hill in the 1850s, a garden of delights was developed in its surroundings. It comes as no surprise that dinosaurs were one of the major attractions in the park at Crystal Palace. The dinosaurs, amidst models of chalk and limestone cliffs and statues, were a signal of progress. But they also brought the past into the present, just at that moment as industrial capitalism prepared its descent into what Lenin termed its highest stage, the stage of wars and imperialism. There appeared the remnants of a distant past, in a bricolage of concrete, tiles, mortar, cast iron drain pipes, wrought iron rods, carved stonework and lead. The dinosaurs were a sign of how far humanity had travelled, a boast about how humans now could know a time from when there were not even humans to know it, and those same humans could shape it in a grand imagining of that which had once moulded itself. At the Crystal Palace, prototypes of life's forms are snared on fake islands, a camel-like anoplotherium, a tortoise-like dysomodon, an iguana-like hyliosaurus, a crocodile-like ichthyosaurus, a frog-like labyrinthodon, an elephantine lizard-like megalosaurus, the tapir-like paleotherium, and so on. We are thrown back into a world of 200 million years ago. Evolution and the crystal brought here into proximity. The crystal palace and the earliest days of life on Earth. The crystal and life. Are crystals alive? Is that which forms itself, itself alive? itself a life. Are crystals alive? They grow. 
As they grow, they form themselves into shapes with facets and edges and curves. It seems to an observer as if they intended to reach that form, that form alone. A shattered crystal produces smaller versions of the original with similar flat surfaces or facets. Crystals heal themselves. They eat. They can be wounded and poisoned. They grow rapidly in their youth and reach an adult phase in which they grow no more. They reproduce themselves. Chemists once wrote of self-activity in crystals, and now they speak of self-organization or self-assembly. Crystals self-assemble into big, highly ordered structures from large numbers of disordered components with an immense degree of accuracy. Life is constituted there in replication and evolution. Recent theorists have asserted that life started in clay, that our ancestry is crystalline. Clay mineral crystals are likely originators of life in a prebiotic environment. The crystals grew as crystals do and broke under mechanical stress. When the crystal broke, the information it stored on structure and shape, that which is evoked in its self-replication, is exposed at the end of the new crystals, which continue to grow. This forms the heritable information of the crystals. What can also be passed on in this is the defect, the impurity. The crystal can inherit modified information. This is the basis of genetic evolution. The clay crystal organisms begin to incorporate protoproteins from the environment to aid their ability to catalyze. In time, these proteins and their nucleic acids take over the mechanism and carbon-based, instead of silicon-based life, would develop. The crystal. Crystal fathers and mothers. Crystals of an idea. The crystal grows. The crystal replicates itself. The crystal reproduces itself over and over. We found the forms that never stop forming. The crystal and the industrially reproduced eye, eye the crystal and the industrially reproduced eye each other up in the crystal palace. The start of industrialization of production and consumption with its proliferation of forms in successive and simultaneous metamorphoses. Here it is. Everything begins and ends in the crystal. A parade of dinosaurs, a parade of things formed, a stockpile of objects to entice the eye, a hint of the unviable, a negative image of the souvenir shop to come, the sock shop, the, the 36 piece whoops, dinner set, the pound shop, pound stretchers, 99p store, never closed, 24 hour online non stop shop. So I'll end that bit there. I think yeah, should we just open it? I think yes. Questions. Questions. Thank you. thinking 
in previous presentation and now as well. And I'm thinking about uh, human need to engage with materials physically on an everyday basis. And I'm thinking what's going to happen with that need if it won't have any outlet, if uh, properties of materials will be injected into materials and therefore there will be things will just grow. And uh, I can't help thinking and uh, trying to de maybe defend the concept of natural in the sense that I think that human beings have uh, this uh, um, maybe gene or code in head to interact with materials and to do maybe something else by doing it than just making stuff or uh, working in the fields. Um, so I would like to ask in uh, this, uh, I think slightly science fiction uh, or futurological uh, context for what will happen with that need if uh, these prophecies still well I, I don't necessarily think that they're prophecies that will uh, I, mean, I, I guess I think they're moments that we've imagined before and it's, it's that that kind of interests me in a sense that I don't think there is a totalizing force although we kind of imagine one and we, at the moment we I guess we're privileged, privileging that kind of minutiae of engagement I mean, I don't think we're proposing this as a... I, I'm confused about your question in the sense whether you think I'm proposing it, kind of. No, no, I, didn't, I don't think I meant it directly, maybe, to this, uh, your presentation, uh, which was very specific, in the sense. I sort of understood the, you know, it was very dreamlike, so... Um, and I, I picked up some things from it, but maybe I'm just thinking about materials uh, in, in, in general and how, how they will um, I mean, grow. I, I think partly, I suppose, part, part of this thing of thinking about um, the Crystal Palace and, and the commodity is in a sense to say that nature aside, although, you know, obviously um, nature too is commodified, but our relationship to the commodity is already so fantastical. So in a sense, our relationship to matter is, is so imbued um, with fantasy. But that, that's not to deny also certain um, landmark moments. I recently showed this image that was gained a couple of years ago of the uh, pentacene molecule, which was a very hard one image which took 20 hours of uh, electronic microscope sort of feeling this, this surface to, to bring back an image of the, um, you know, of, of something utterly invisible to the eye. And, and I showed it to some students at an art college in Denmark and um, one young man was, was so upset by the fact that it did match our textbook imaginations of what these these rings and their connectors look like. So it's almost like you, know, you could reverse the question and look at how our fantasies of the material are actually made factual or sort of it, it embodied materially through through these new technologies in, in a way. So I think they were very complex, difficult relationships of, of fantasies around matter and our inhabitation of the world and how we understand that world as a materiality. And are we just talking through this notion of new materialities about just a, 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 a denser, more expanded sense of, of matter um, whereby you know, the visible is not is not our access to it, but but other modes of of apperception, obviously technologically enhanced ones. But it needn't necessarily make it dissipate. I mean, the, there's a thing I love from uh, Walter Benjamin quoting an old um, English scientist, Arthur Eddington. I think he was English, talking about if 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 we really understood physics 
um, we would totally interpret the world as Kafka uh, because you know all, all that's involved in putting your foot over the, the threshold of a door, all the things that are happening around the kind of mobility of molecules and the uncertainty of, of everything would, you know, if we understand that, it, you know, the, the universe is this wild chaos. It's a wonder that we are able to make this step. And, you know, that, those, those sort of senses of things have, have long existed. And in some way, this is just another versioning of that, I suppose. But, you know, I also totally agree. I want to stroke furry things and <laughs> <laughs> inhabit a material okay. universe that this I is, can control. This is something very much I think we're exploring in a sense is that confrontation between kind of, you know, the, the, the clay is a formless article and then the clay is a highly crafted object and this kind of whole set of complex questions that will come between the two things. Which I think, you know, for me it keeps coming back to that minute crystal and the, the ability to, to make it bend to image and bend to fantasy. Because yes, it isn't just about making things, it's about making fantasies, I guess. Oh, I just, I, just uh, I really enjoyed the footage of the um, giant vegetable growing um, <laughs> conference, or whatever it was, and uh, the way you were talking about um, you're interested in the, in the amateur, in the kind of tinkerer, and I just wondered because that, uh, and this I don't mean this to be a rude question, but as as an artist working with ideas that are part of a hugely specialist field, I find that myself I find that metaphor, the amateur, really really incredibly useful as as an artist. And I wondered if you saw a kind of parallel in some way between you as an artist trying to grapple with these things and the. Um, the amateur enthusiast trying to also grapple in, in a completely different cu cultural arena with the sort of um, with some of those pursuits. Absolutely, yeah. I think kind of oscillating between some of this kind of body of knowledge, there's also very quickly kind of um, dissipated or absurd. And I think the sense of the absurd in this is something that really interests me. Those kind of absurd disruptions in scale between the giant pumpkins and the minute steel. We know that 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 really does. I think that's very important. And I'm also interested in the ideas of skill and what skill is to artists and what skill is to making and what knowledge is to scientists. You know, at what point, um, you know, how 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 knowledge is kind of distributed through that as well. So yeah, I think there's lots of really useful parallels there. The amateur and the, and the, and the specialist, and, and between and actually, it's a kind of yeah, folk knowledge and, and other kinds of knowledge, and it's a kind of exciting, funny dynamic between these two things. Oh, well, it is funny having a mic at such a small room. That's what's strange if you um, speak, isn't it? Uh, I, yeah, I, sorry, I, I was actually, I actually actually had a point about that, uh, relating to Esther's, what Esther was talking about previously, and, and indeed the question, but um, but sort of picking up on um, Jenny's on your point, I, um, I'd, I slightly kind of feel queasy when I, uh, th I think the sort of relationship of, you know, the expert scientist and the, the, the sort of mistake-making kind of, um, uh, serendipitous kind of creative artist who's sort of a little bit like the child playing with their bricks is, a, is a, an image that slightly I have reservations about, but um, uh, well, more than slightly have reservations about. But effectively, um, I was thinking about the idea of sort of getting in touch with materials and stitching through both the previous presentation and this one is the idea of radically changing understandings of just what stuff is, that actually we can't return to a sort of organicist metaphor or, a, or, or an organicist fable or myth that, that, you know, everyone likes kind of, you know, you know, to sort of, you know, shaping stuff out of the mud, that, um, uh, you know, our relationship to stuff keeps changing. And as you were talking, Esther, I found something winging its way through completely from left field, which is a recollection of a piece of work, actually another a big video project by the artist Omar Fast, which was showing in the last year's Venice p and um, It actually was relating in quite circuitous and complex ways to the present um, situation where an assortment of American military staff who pilot drones are actually claiming that they are suffering from 
post-traumatic stress, stress disorder. I was thinking there you've got a really extreme example, a really vivid example of the way in which the sense of actual material experience being completely, or if not completely, then radically remodeled and readapted by contemporary technologies. These guys are not in the heat of battle, you know, they're not in the trenches, they're not, you know, these images that we've just been seeing from, you know, World War One. It's absolutely, you know, if there could possibly be an antithesis of that, and it is, and yet it isn't at the same time. These guys are, they're, they're there, they're in, they're manipulating this stuff, and it's having effects in the material world, and that's, you know, affecting them in unanticipated ways. So, yeah, um, yeah. That and that's, that. that's interesting, and, I mean, in the First World War, human, bodies who were killed in war was called material or matériel um, in, in French and German, so I believe. And, you know, the stakes are still the same. That's the limit you don't get beyond. And I suppose that's my cynicism as well about what, what drives this. But, I mean, Philip talked about medicine and you did mention military technologies. Um, you know, but I think military and commercial technologies are you know, absolutely the drivers of, of these things and that means you know the results are yet again the same and, and, and the subjective results for those people um, involved in it are, are yet again the same you know participation either either in selling people stuff they don't want or need really or killing people you know it's you know that's um, what motivates most things these days. Um, to come back to your question of the amateur, actually it wasn't about the childish state and blundering idiot, it's more actually that there is a kind of, there is a kind of, um, there is an attempt to actually grapple with something very important within that, uh, that does interest me, the ways in which they do kind of take on a centric, eccentric kind of positions, but actually that later science was revealed to be eccentric also. I mean, do you know what I mean? I don't, I don't think it's that simple. It's not about the wandering, pointing story. I guess I'm, I'm, I'm recalling narratives um, read in literature from you know, the old kind of World War Institute of art, which tended to construct those two narratives. The, 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 the smart scientist in me and, the, and the sort of productively, uh, productively mistake making. No, I'm kind of more interested in kind of pre scene or legacy kind of kitchen science or hacking. You know what I mean? The way that there might be an amateur scientist. So I'm kind of more interested actually, although I did kind of satirise it with nurse, they are actually doing what a lot of scientists are doing in agricultural politics. They're force feeding plants in exactly the same way as steam spicing it. And I don't know, there's a kind of more complex relationship than that thing about kind of access and, and agency. I think it's more important than that world is kind of comedic or funny. I don't think I'd, I'd dismiss the artist as that. I think that would be wrong. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, we're at 9.15 now, which um, I think means I have to bring uh, the evening to an end formally, but uh, the bar's still open if you'd like to drink. If you'd like to ask Melanie, what on earth is going on over here? <laughs> if you'd like to quiz Philip or Esther before they run away.